This is Twit. I'm just wondering if there was a, a in your reporting for these books a, a, a true secret sauce that is like a common denominator from each of these different programs that have led the company to really maintain that momentum that that we see it having. I guess that the public even can see it having uh, with with all of these test flights and and with maybe their their embrace of like sharing everything on social media, including the failures, uh, mm-hmm. which you don't see a lot of companies do um, uh, there. Uh, that you you do see will be key for both like the I don't want to say post Falcon Nine because it seems like that's a that's going to be like a, a workhorse for for the foreseeable. let the man answer. Well, no, well, let me finish my question, Rod. Come on, waiting for a question here, Rod. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what <laughs> what is the 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 secret? What is is there a common denominator secret sauce that they've been able to keep as a company? Uh, I through these different programs. I, you know, people think lots of different things about Elon, and I get that. He's extremely controversial these days um, and says a lot of things I think that make people uncomfortable, myself included. But I, I don't think you can get away from the fact that he is the secret sauce yeah. of SpaceX, at least in the sense of he has from day one provided this dominant vision. He's never really moved away from it like and that is to make humans a multi-planetary species and that journey begins on mars and like so every step the company takes is to further that ambition um and if something isn't working like propulsive landing and dragon then okay he'll course correct back away from that um but but the goal is mars and it's it's he's if something is not advancing that goal then he doesn't have time for it Mm -hmm. at spacex and i think the other thing is that he just every day like makes sure that the people working for him know that you know they have to go faster and if there are problems that they're running into don't be like me don't procrastinate right like you're like oh i got a problem i'm going to worry about that next week no he's like tackle the biggest problem first and if you need help solving it let me know Right? Don't not not tell me, um, and and it's hard to get away from sort of that energy continuing to propel the company forward. You know, you look at a lot of other space companies start out with some big disruptive vision, and they disrupt it, and then they kind of become the next Boeing or Lockheed or or whatever. And, and SpaceX is not. They're either, they're the most powerful company in spaceflight today, but they're still being disruptive. And again, you kind of have to attribute that to the founder who's still pushing forward every day, even if he's also playing Diablo at the same time. <laughs> Diablo 4. <right? laughs> I have to say, as I was as I was reading your book last night, I wished I had a PDF of it so I could do a word search to see how many times the word faster showed up in there. <laughs> because in <laughs> some chapters, it's again and again. And I thought, man, I mean, you can almost feel through your writing, and not in a mean-spirited way at all, but the pounding that these people get at this company. Yeah. I mean, it's just ruthless. Relentless. Yeah. So uh, if I have my numbers right, SpaceX did a total of 96 launches in 2023. They're planning 135 ish for this year if they finish as they want. And I'm at Kennedy Space Center right now. We saw, well, heard mostly one go up yesterday. And I think there's another uh, Falcon uh, planned for Saturday. So, you know. I'm I'm living the evidence of how fast these things are, are taking off these days. Um, and yet, in comparison, the only company I can really compare to SpaceX, uh, ULA has 15 launches in 24 and launched three times in 2023. How Help me imagine how anybody can compete with SpaceX at this point in the next 10 years. I mean, we've been watching a lot of stuff go in the front of the Blue Origin plant out here and not seeing much come out the back. You know, it's been kind of constipated for a while. At least finally the, the big rocket did roll out. But it just feels like they're going to dominate the field for years to come. It, they have a huge lead in launch. Like, like it's now been nine years since they first landed a rocket, and no one has repeated that feat even while everyone acknowledges that that is probably the ideal way to do first stage reuse. Um, Mm. I think that probably will change within the next 12 to 18 months that we'll see Blue Origin successfully land. Um, We'll see probably a Chinese company successfully land an orbital rocket. Um, But there's no question they're already far, far ahead um, in launch. And uh, they're also ahead in in satellite internet, like they're five to seven years ahead of Project Kuiper and China's 
constellations and, and everything else. And so they are the leaders and they're going faster, right? And so when launch, like they're taking the next step with Starship and no one has a vehicle that's like Starship, right? That it's an insane design and it's preposterous that they're that they're pulling it off. So there are a couple of things could happen. One, Elon could self-combust. Um, he can Trump could get into a furious row over something, which does not strike me as particularly unlikely. And all of a sudden, the U.S. government is favoring other competitors for SpaceX. Although, like if NASA wants to have a human spaceflight program, you're kind of screwed unless you use SpaceX. And if mm -hmm. you want to have low Earth orbit, low internet broadband, you, you kind of got to go through Starlink and Starshield if you're DOD. And, um, you know, the military is counting on SpaceX for at least half its launches. Um, it's, and certainly for assured access to space. Now, some of those dials start to change in the next five years as Blue Origin comes online and Vulcan becomes reliable and Kuiper comes online. But for, for now, there's really nothing, there's no viable competitors to SpaceX. But, you know, I mean, you know, look, look what happened to Howard Hughes, right? And so Elon has spinning a lot of plates. Um, and, you know, he's in his 50s now. So I think that's a risk. I think if Gwen Shotwell retires, that's a concern. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's happening imminently, but that's probably on the roadmap for her. Um, and like, you know, you could see like the space, uh, the NASA SpaceX Mars program becoming the dominant paradigm of the Trump administration. Um, and then like, if there's a Democrat elected in four years, like they want to make a clean sweep of, of programs. And, and that would really, you know, maybe they would change the focus. I, you know, I, so there's, I think the risks are not like, other companies catching up through technical prowess or funding because SpaceX is so far ahead, it would be more of like some kind of political thing or some kind of personnel thing um, that kind of takes the steamroller, you know, off the tracks. Um, and, and I frankly, in terms of technical competition, I would not look in the United States. I'd look to China mm -hmm. um, and mm. the, the very interesting things. I mean, that, that company, excuse me, that country and its startups are seeking to emulate what SpaceX has done, whereas the reaction in the United States is everyone's tried to do it a little bit differently because I don't think they want to be seen as copying SpaceX. Yeah. Um, but China's- and like, emulate is such yeah. a kind word for China, by the way. China has yeah. China has no qualms about oh, no. <laughs> directly ripping I mean, off designs for Falcon 9. That, that's a better phrase, yeah. yeah. You, you just saw that at the Zuhai uh, Air Show yeah. uh, just, just recently. I mean, it's, it's an ex almost a near exact replica of Starship yeah. that they're saying that the the- that that one company is going to build. Um, well, and before you, that, there were almost replicas of the Falcon Nine. Yeah, yeah, and like mashups of New Shepard and Falcon Nine too. Well, I've seen. Yeah, literally within a week of the Starship Tower catch, which was so preposterous, right? Within a week, with a week of that, a Chinese company had a proposal out to get funding to develop their own tower catching, you know, rocket catching tower. So, <laughs> yeah. You, you you mentioned you mentioned the military. And the DOD, um, Eric, earlier about like their their dependency now, or I guess reliance on mm -hmm. uh, uh, on, on uh, SpaceX and Starlink for for their their own their own uses. And I can remember a time when the Air Force, you know, signed a lease to SpaceX to use a launch pad out of Vandenberg, and then told them, "No, you can't try to launch your Falcon One rocket." <laughs> out of Vandenberg, go find some other place out in the middle of the South Pacific, and um, and is it is it a, a just the fact that they can see the success now, and that's what sells them on it, or was there a sea change in the DoD that led to more openness that led to these contracts that we saw? With I think it's recently? yeah. I think it's a couple of things. First of all, I think it's been gradual over time, and it it has been part parcel of just accepting the fact that this company is out there doing it. And so you need to avail yourself of it. Um, but I mean, SpaceX had to kick open the door, right? In 2014, they sued um, the government um, because of ULA's uh, sole source contract award for, for heavy lift um, and got a piece of those that deals. And, and obviously they haven't looked back, but there were also believers in DOD, like right at the beginning, their very first federal funding came from DARPA, you mm -hmm. know, back in, 2003 or four um for for the, the first mission like was was sponsored by darpa and there have been key believers at dod all along um you know like uh like the, their first launch their 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 ula contested their um their pad 
uh, Slick 40, uh, Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape. And, and Susan Helms right. was the Brigadier General in charge of the 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 the, um, the range there, and she approved it under, mm-hmm. despite heavy lobbying. Um, and well, and they, excuse me for breaking in, but I, I did really enjoy the chapter where you talked about, I mean, she took chances with her career to go to bat for these guys when they were still kind of an unknown quantity, huh? Yeah, and the range also, you know, allowed them to land their booster in 2015, not far from the $2 billion Eastern Spacecraft Processing Facility that's owned by the National Reconnaissance Office. And they were they were pushing very hard for SpaceX not to do what the NRO was was opposed to that. They, they allowed them to do autonomous flight termination system. Now, look, if you talk to SpaceX or Elon and ask them about it, he said that you had to basically do this kicking and screaming. But it's not like the, the, the federal government has recognized reality. I mean, look at NASA. You, to, to go back from DOD to NASA, you know, mm-hmm. NASA has gone from a paradigm where it, it awards cost plus contracts for major programs like we saw with SLS and Orion. And those were kind of the last – and Gateway. And those were kind of the last pieces of that. And now it's like almost everything is a services-based contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly the key elements of the Artemis program are all services based. Now it remains to be seen whether that ultimately will be successful, but that is, that is simply a product of SpaceX showing that it could be done. Yeah. Um, so it's completely changed the contracting, the way the federal government does contracting. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>